Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to construction, design, and architecture. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. My dad's old plumbing shop. And he's kind of using this as our uh, design and we feel other controls. A few years ago, yeah. Is this really the Building Science Podcast? Tell me about you guys. Can we sit here? Yeah, let's yeah. pull up a chair. Uh, in this episode, you're going to hear some audio from Christoph and I's trip to Santa Cruz, California this winter, where we sat down with Masana, a company that makes radiant cooling and heating panels that go on your ceilings. We've talked about this technology before, but after this trip, we couldn't be more excited about the reality of this technology and its introduction into the marketplace. So stick with us for this episode of the Building Science Podcast, and we're all going to learn a little bit about something that might change the nature of the HVAC industry and the building science industry for the future to come. Let's hear from the Masana folks now. My name is Francesco Marchesi. I'm one of the founders of this company five years ago. Um, so it's a new, it's a new, it looks like a new company here, but it's not. So Masana is an Italian company it or is. is that your company? No, it's a, in the United States it's our company. The founder is Roberto Masana. He started this business 20 years ago. Basically, he started the business looking into the control for radiant floor. After one year, he figured out radiant floor um, uh, is better, is, radiant cooling is better to, on the ceiling instead of the floor. And then he designed the first panel. The climate he was in in Italy, was it it's hot, humid? Super humid, it's Venice. Okay. So, oh, Venice. really hot summer, cold winter, and really humid uh, yeah. uh, environment, really. So, Roberto Messana. Robert Messana is the founder, is part of our uh, company as well here in the United States. Uh, he wrote different books. But Francesco wasn't the only one for Messana at the meeting. Meet Greg. My name is Greg Koss, and I'm the technical support and product installation trainer. So, we actually met and installed a product different time. before he knew his partner, uh, Alessandro. He brought in a product, and I had a I had a construction business, and one of my workers had met somebody that he knew that was talking about some solar panels, and I was you know I'm doing a lot of solar thermal, so I was you know I'm always like let's check it out, it's something new, and then come to find out it was a, you know it was a radiant uh, delivery system, and I was going wow I think you're onto something here because I've been you know involved with projects trying to do radiant cooling and heating through the floor, and radiant cooling just doesn't work, and it's almost like a waste of uh, energy and, and money to try to do it that way. No so, convective component. Right, no convective component at all. So when and you know when you talk about cooling on the floor, <clears throat> uh, who wants to stand on a cold floor? Nobody wants. So it's really uncomfortable. So let's get it straight. We're talking with some folks from Masana, the company, and it's a company that was started by a guy named Masana in Italy, and he wrote a book. Right now, the book great. is only in Italian. He just right now, he got to translate in English, of course. Um, but it's a nice book. Um, the title in Italian? It's, is it Thermal, thermal Comfort? comfort? I, uh, wasn't it Thermal Comfort? Oh, uh, Capire il Comfort. Yeah, it's like mean? Understand the Comfort. Mm. Mm. Capire. Capire. I capisco or what is, yeah, I don't understand. understand. Do you understand. capiche? Yeah, yeah the capiche, capiche. Like uh, <laughs> New Yorker, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so Capire Comfort is one of the books he's wrote. And uh, so, but three years ago in the United States, uh, we promove uh, um, the radiant cooling. So we own right now the domain in the internet is called yeah, radiantcooling.com. Yeah, radiantcooling.com. And recently we also uh, own the domain, it's uh, radiantarchitecture.com. He's a and, uh, really knowledgeable guy. It was fun to talk to him. He just is full of good information. And it, re- it was really intriguing how he, he basically learned about how the human body receives heat and cold and what the feelings mean and designed the system based on that. Right. Rather than just, you know, okay, let's figure out how to get some heat in this room. It's like, what fi- what heat and cool feels the best? Right. You know? Okay, Christoph here in the studio. Quick interjection. I wanted to make sure we understand what we're talking about. Um, it's not that complicated, but it does have some new words. We're talking about radiant 
heating and what's called radiant cooling, which is more like uh, heat absorbing, and how that contrasts to what we mainly do right now in the United States. And I would describe what we mainly do right now in the U.S. as a fishbowl strategy. And basically, you guys in your indoor buildings are the fish, me included. We are fish, and we are immersed in a fluid of air that is controlled to be at the right temperature, uh, ostensibly providing flawless comfort. And just think of the fishbowl strategy. Imagine that that fishbowl is outdoors, and there's heat pouring in through the glass on all sides, like sunshine pouring in through the glass. And even if we can keep the water temperature correct, you're still going to be absorbing heat from the sun, and you're not going to be comfortable. That's very similar to what happens in our buildings today when we do air conditioning. We are, in fact, primarily focused on conditioning the air, which secondarily leads to conditioning the surfaces around you in that room because they're touching the air. And uh, thirdly, I guess, uh, conditioning you. So with the radiant heating and cooling system, the radiant energy, and when you hear radiant, you know, think light, think line of sight, speed of light. That's how the energy is moving from you to the surface when you're hotter than the surface and how it's coming from the surface to you when you're uh, colder than the surface. So line of sight, speed of light, radiant energy is what we're using to condition you. So the, the overarching concept I want to get across here is that in one strategy, we're conditioning the air around you, and in the other, we're conditioning you. So when we think about radiant cooling, people, you know, uh, the classic example is uh, going uh, in Europe and walk through this uh, massive church. Mm -hmm. There's no air conditioning in the summer, but as soon as you walk into the church, you feel cold. Yeah. Why? You're radiating heat. So yeah, because uh, the massive of this stone are still cold, so it's your extra heat will be moving and will be absorbed to the cold surfaces. Mm -hmm. Of course, we cannot build uh, this church anymore, all right? Mm. but we can active the, the, the surfaces running chilled water, yeah. control mm -hmm. the humidity. So that's what we, would, that's what we do with the, with the panels. Okay, so we know that there are panels that can radiate cooling that suck up your heat, but what about heating? It blasts energy down. Mm -hmm. Not in a sense where it's uncomfortable. It actually feels good. You know, that sun shining mm -hmm. on your body mm -hmm. when it's cold after you got out of the water and you're sur after surfing, you know, that feels good. That's that kind of radiant feel. Mm -hmm. um, this office, because of water, it'll, it'll satisfy in five minutes. It's like you're going, well, it just went off. I go, wow, it just like raised this room temperature like that. With, with higher temperature water. With higher temperature water. And the slab water. heats up as well. Everything on the surface. That's what the beauty is. You walk around, it's like everything that you're, you, that's in contact with the human body where you are gets bombarded so with the radiant. Under the table will be shaded. Eventually, you know, it'll soak through. The same as a radiant floor that's coming up mm -hmm. where it's going through wood, right. carpet, flooring, furniture, you know. Yeah, it feels good on the feet, but the reality is it's backwards. Yeah. It really... I mean, one of the things that Masana wrote that was really intriguing, our bodies were made to get heat from above, like from the sunshine, right? Okay, I think I understand. There are panels that you can put on your ceiling, and they both provide cooling and heating. But it seems like, okay, that's fine in theory, but I'm a little confused about how it actually works. Christoph, can you help us understand? Yes, I think I can. So the answer is physics. There you go. That's how it works. Works by physics. <laughs> um, specifically, what's happening is you're you're putting your radiant surface in a good spot. You're putting it on the ceiling where you don't have to be concerned that you're going to one day decide to rearrange the rearrange the furniture in the room and be blocking your radiant surfaces, trapping heat, or or worse, making cold pockets that could have condensation. And we'll talk about condensation later. Um, but Really, the, the pith of it is that what you're doing is you're creating a very dense heat store or heat sink. Well, that's a little geeky. What you're doing is you're creating hot or cold water, which can be done very efficiently, and water is much more dense than air. And all this is reminding me of the earlier podcast we did when we were talking about radiant. And so you're circulating these hot and cold fluids through pipes, that are linked to uh, metal so that it makes the temperature more uniform on the ceiling. And then that 
heat radiates through the drywall that's on the ceiling uh, into the space. And one last important caveat, one very, very important distinction between, let's say, the classic radiant heated floor and a thermally active ceiling or, or radiant heating and cooling ceiling panel is that in the floor situation, you actually are using the mass effect as your thermal flywheel, as your energy storage device. You're radiating heat into the slab at a slow rate, and it gradually gets absorbed. And then you get that warm slab set up, and it can buffer uh, heat, I'm sorry, cold spots outside and basically absorb more cold when it needs to or radiate more heat to the cold when it needs to. So you have this big mass effect going on, which can be good, but in a cooling paradigm, you really want to be able to control the panel temperature. And therefore, what's behind the radiant surfaces on the ceiling is insulation. It's uh, EPS, um, expanded polystyrene, styrofoam insulation, about an inch and a half of that, so that the heat and the, the cold is isolated from the mass of the structure and is coupled to you in the indoor space. And yet another one more thing, actually. I thought I was at the last one, but there's one more that's coming up. And this has to do with convection. And what I mean by convection is I mean the mass of air in a space, convection in a thermal comfort in an indoor environment context, means that there's a mass of air in the space and the air is at a certain um, energy level, enthalpy level, thermodynamic state, and we benefit from the movement of that air from place to place. A forced air system is implicitly relying on convection, on forced convection to move that cold air or that heated air across you. When we have a radiant cooled ceiling, check this out, here's what happens. You have uh, a natural physical process occurring where different sources of heat in the building um, radiate the heat into the space, into the air. Keep in mind air is heavy, right? The room you're in probably has hundreds if not thousands of pounds of air in it. The air now absorbs that heat and what happens when air absorbs heat is the molecules start vibrating more. When the molecules start vibrating more, they bounce into each other more quickly and more frequently, and therefore they knock themselves farther apart. This is a complicated way <laughs> to describe density, so they get less dense. Heated air is less dense, and therefore the heated air in a space floats to the top and rides on top of the cool air. If you ever hear someone say, by the way, heat rises, that's not true. Heated fluids rise and float on top of cooler fluids. So the hot air in the space, that's a very geeky way of saying the hot air in the space is going to accumulate at the ceiling, which is what? The ceiling is cold because that's our thermally active surface. So now we have two things about to happen. We have a large temperature difference because we have the hottest air next to the coldest surface, so that drives the heat flow into the surface efficiently and effectively. And then the air now at, at the actual ceiling is cool and it is more dense and it drizzles down on the occupants. So you have this mass of air uh, adding comfort to the space by not just being at the right temperature, but moving. Uh, there's a little known fact that even if you keep the air at the right temperature and humidity, we humans actually do like some air movement uh, in our air. And with a radiant cooled ceiling in a cooling dominated climate, when we're in cooling mode, we get the benefit of this convective comfort benefit that's just a natural consequence of uh, the materials, fluids, and thermodynamics involved. So yeah, there you go, physics. Uh, and it's strange if you think uh, this technology is coming from Europe. You look here, now the panel is drywall. So you, like can go in, you can go in Italy and say, what is drywall? What is jazz? What is... Nobody knows. Right. We build with the... Uh, concrete mm -hmm. and plastic. Mm -hmm. Our standard sheet is just half inch uh, drywall. Yeah. This one yeah. here. Just like that. But we yeah. have these two different ones? Um, yeah. There are the different graphite. ones here. So there's a panel made in <clears throat> Germany. They add some graphite parts into the drywall mm -hmm. and increase 17% the performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean the mm -hmm. yeah. Then we have the quad. It's a two by two panel for a T-bar system. Uh, the standard one and the 5.8. What am I looking at over my head here? Half inch. 
it's really, really cool stuff. The panels look like they belong in the building just as our standard American drywall practices already do. So you're not taking away any aesthetic value by installing these radiant panels. And the amazing thing is behind that drywall, there's a series of tubing that has a glycol solution in it. And that glycol solution is the vehicle by which everything is regulated in terms of temperature. But back to this panel, mm -hmm. you stop the flow of, of the glycol solution through the panels. Mm -hmm. You don't change the temperature of the glycol solution, we stop. you just stop it. We mix. Right. So we just take the, re the three-way mixing valve floats between the supply and the return and if we got to start, you know, backing off, we like swing that and take the return water and mix it with enough supply to get the right output. So, so suddenly, actually, you, you switch from cooling mode to kind of like heating mode almost. You're yeah, running like warmer fluids. Or neutral, we just basically shut off. Room, we, we, we just shut off and, you know, let, let it come up to ambient um, mm -hmm. if, if that's the way it's got to be. But our, our three-way diverting valves all swing to basically full bypass. So I just want to make sure that uh, Greg didn't geek out too much and, and lose us, because he was talking about some pretty important characteristics of these panels. Basically, he's talking about a valve going to full bypass. That just means shutting a spigot, like shutting a sink valve all the way off. And what happens in full bypass is you're fully bypassing the incoming uh, fluid stream, the heated water or the cooled water. But beyond all this, there's something really important for, for us all to make sure we're paying attention to. And it has to do with heating capacity or cooling capacity and the control of that. Um, we live in a world right now where most of our systems don't handle capacity very well. I mean, I, our heating and cooling systems. What I mean by that is you could have an air conditioner in your house that's a three-ton air conditioner. But many times of the day in the year, you, you need a 0.3-ton air conditioner, right? This is why we as a company, and we've talked about this in the past on podcast, are interested in variable refrigerant flow, variable capacity devices. Keep in mind briefly, capacity has to do with how much the equipment can handle in terms of delivering heat or delivering cooling, and load is what it's supposed to be handling. So like a Ford F-350 has the capacity to handle a handle a heavier load than a Ford F-150. Um, so here's the deal with capacity and load. What happens is engineers like us calculate how much load your building's going to have, and it's usually referred to as a load calculation when it's really a peak load calculation. And what happens is over the year, the load is constantly changing, right? There's just one or two or a few moments of the year where you're actually hitting peak load, and the rest of the year you're less than that. And so... What we're doing in the industry on the air side is we are moving towards variable refrigerant flow, which offers the ability to vary capacity. And then we are moving into equipment that gets smaller, right? The smallest typical um, American manufactured system is a ton and a half. Now we're moving down to systems that are a half a ton. But check this out. Your bedroom for your average bedroom, a half a ton is still way too big. It might be, a half a ton in other numbers is 6,000 BTUs an hour. And you might have a 2,000 BTU an hour or a 3 or a 4,000 BTU an hour peak load. Suddenly here with these radiant panels, you just put in as many panels as you want, or excuse me, as you need to cover that load. And it's as simple as you define the panel temperature, and then that will tell you how many, how many square feet of panel you need on the ceiling to meet your peak load. So I really want us to understand that there's a, there's a key functional shift when we move from an air-based system to this radiant panel. And this is the ability not to have too much heating and cooling in the space. You can have what you need, when you need it. And of course, if you're sizing, let's say you have a 3,000 BTU an hour peak load in your bedroom, well, that means the valve is open uh, completely. You're letting the cooled fluid in, and the panel is cold at its minimum surface temperature that it's been designed for, and it is absorbing 3,000 BTUs every hour, which is, what, 50 BTUs every minute, something like that, um, which is still a lot, right? Remember, 50 full-size kitchen matches every minute. That's about one a second. So it's absorbing that energy, and it's taking it back in this very dense glycol fluid, essentially water, 
to a heat exchanger and it's rejecting it outside or it's rejecting it into the water. So where are these panels actually used? How can I apply them to my own projects? Yeah, we yeah. use uh, these for uh, schools, mm-hmm. hospitals, uh, movie theater. Yeah, I'm pretty. I mean, I, my commercial. I've got a, com- a lot of commercial background, so I'm really excited to see this go into more commercial buildings. We did a university dorm just recently in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and oh, that's nice. kind of our first commercial site, so that was kind of fun. And here could be the Achilles heel of that. <laughs> what about if, because it's an apartment, how do I build you for your energy use? Uh, they, see, they've got all that technology out now. The water B2, flow. B2 flow. So B2 flow. Ah, Every fantastic. apartment. Yeah, I've actually got a guy so like tenant billing built into the your control system excuse me yeah i mean it's basically something similar i had a friend of mine that uh is an engineer that had a, a solar company and then he started you know that solar business didn't really do too well here believe it or not the solar thermal and um hmm. he got into controls he actually has a control with the csi that basically you know is a btu monitor and he could see he was showing me how he could set it up we were looking at a multifamily housing project here in santa cruz and one of his ideas was to meter each unit's use of not only that domestic but heating and cooling because you can measure it right it's easy to That's you know fantastic. so as long as you have a good calibrated um device um then and where would the device it would be on the wall somewhere like it would be thing? a remote and then just wiring to sensors mm-hmm. right and then basically hitting certain ports on their controller but it could and, come from <clears> his <throat> side i mean i'm thinking of the controls magic side it, it if you have somewhere where you're monitoring the temperature like you drew, yeah, and you know the gallons per minute right. on yes, the pump, there you could got the BT easily. Use, right? yeah. Wait a minute, we need to get some things straight here. I have some very real concerns about the potential for condensation. If we're not talking about an air-based system, there's definitely going to be some humidity issues, right? Some condensation on the surfaces. How's that we'll you buy in, uh, in Texas? Yeah, so yeah, that's what I was about to say. When it's controlled nicely indoors, it's 52 to 56, but outdoors. Peak, believe it or not, it'll, it'll hit the low 80s, upper 70s. And so yeah, I see uh, some pretty serious dew points. And that's extremely rare. That's like some sort of um, windless day where a lot of Gulf humidity has come up. Yeah. Just to be clear, so we don't have any issue with you, with the condensation. I know that a lot of people, you can get them interested in radiant, you can go down the thermal comfort route, and oh. they're starting to swoon. They're going, oh man, this sounds pretty awesome. And then their mind's going to start to slam shut when they think, I'm going to have water dripping from my uh-huh. ceiling and it's going to be moldy and I'm going to be a mess. So, but Italy is humid and you don't have this happen. New York is humid. Dubai is more humid. You don't have this in Dubai though. We have one. Yes. You have a radiant cooling system in Dubai. 15 years ago, we test this system in Dubai. Oh my gosh. With 110 outside temperature air and dew point I think was like uh, close to 90. Yeah. Dew point in Dubai is just world it's record. Crazy. No problem. I mean, you can treat the humidity inside of the building with a, uh, Mm-hmm. The a dedicated outdoor air system, we have, a dedicated we have a humidifier. Control and, but also, if you don't have that one, yes, you don't. The performance of the panel of the panel is not high, but never, never you see a condensation mm-hmm. problem on the surface. You might get some moisture accumulation. No, no, in the no, material. nothing because we control the dew point, so we close the mixing valve. How, how quickly? So I see there's insulation behind the panel, so it's more thermally coupled to the space and less to the structure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How quickly will it change temperature? Do you have data on that? Really, really quick. Yes. Really, really quick. Like Close to like a metal system. So it would change one degree Fahrenheit in 10 minutes? Are you talking Based about room temperatures? Room tem- yeah, yeah, how quickly could that... So the worst case scenario is someone leaves all the doors and windows open suddenly Correct. on a very humid day, <clears throat> which paradoxically they probably wouldn't do. It's happened. But if they do that... Mm-hmm. The panel has to quickly change temperature. It is. It's and it does. Mm-hmm. Low thermal mass. Because it's low thermal that's mass. A, that's a big problem with radio So in floor. 10 minutes it can uh, change temperature. Less true. than that. Uh, big in five problem. minutes it can change temperature, I'm pressing. It is, it is. <laughs> because good, yeah. as soon as you close uh, uh, the supply temperature of water, it's gonna the thermal mass is... It's going to adjust to room temperature. <clears throat> correct. There's no thermal mass. So I there's a two philosophy. When you talk about cooling, two big philosophies. One is big thermal mass, radiant floor. Okay. So you keep your, your floor cold... But as you know, like you told before, as soon as some people open the windows, you got condensation on the floor, hundred mm-hmm, percent. Mm-hmm. With this, heat, so the other philosophy is low thermal mass system, and this is perfect low thermal mass is gypsum, mm-hmm. metal, right? So as soon we stop the supply temperature water get into the panel, 
we also stop the condensation. Uh, and so, it's all about the surface too. So yes. our water temperature is always about five or six degrees cooler going through the panels because it knows that the surface temperature, it's you know, is really where we're concerned. So it's kind of driving the water temperature down to as, as low as we can get it, kind of to ride that curve. And as 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 indoor air quality and the the, the uh, humidity level or the dew point starts to climb, so does our water temperature, and then you start to lose your cooling um, quite quickly. Um, so it's really important to maintain an indoor air quality. So in an event where somebody opens a bunch of doors and windows, the system sees that, it starts to close the uh, three-way mixing valve, raising the water temperature until, and then it'll just start falling it as it's we dry it back yeah. out and fall it right back down again. So, and so by indoor air quality, <clears throat> you're actually meaning the, the humidity in the air. Yes. The actual yes. quality of the humidity. All right, this is definitely worth checking out, but how do they go about accomplishing this even? What are the products that you would need in order to pull off a radiant system inside a structure. So you Misana know. is a it's a manufacturer company um, manufacturing three different type of um, product line. We have the panels, it's called Ray Magic. Then we have controls, it's Control Magic. And then we have an air treatment, it's called Air Magic. Okay, so let's not dive into a huge conversation about controls because what I really want to know about are the panels themselves. So when you guys, um, when these are actually installed, do they usually install them in tandem with other drywall. So if you only had this strip, would you have drywall that's flush with it all the way across? We have a blank panel that um, we sell. Um, you can frame with a two by four down flat and just use regular sheetrock. Uh -huh. But we try to get everybody to, you know, use the a complete system because now you've like actually changed the R value of your room just by adding our, this panel. Every panel, the insulation we have, is certified uh, R10. Okay. Yeah. So all the time you so install the panel, you have a heating, cooling, right. sound absorption. It's all EPS. It's, it's all EPS. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so you have a heating, cooling, sound absorption, thermal, uh, and dry one. Because dry in one. the end... So it's, is it rated for sound absorption too? It yeah. is. Okay. It is. It is. They actually just did a bunch of testing. 9.97, yeah. Okay. Another thing that's really interesting about these panels is, uh, you know, they're self-balancing um, you know, so you, your pressure drop across them is kind of equal all the way through. So you can like link eight of those together and they all self, kind of self-balance because of the way that the tubing is inside the panel, the way they, uh, the, where the supply and returns are connected. Wow, clever. So that's, that's pretty neat. That's the pattern um, we have. So does Masana only specialize in the radiant panel side of things, or are they actually concerned with the air treatment as well? Because that seems like a pretty big piece of the equation that we haven't really touched mm -hmm. on yet. So, um, and the Air Magic, it's a dedicated outdoor air system? Correct. Or, or Plus, it's, a, it's, a, it's, more, it's more than that. It's a unit. Uh, we have different type of units, vertical, horizontal, uh, starting from 120 CFM, up to 1200 CFM. Oh, exciting. Uh, but the last one, the new model we have, it's a vertical one. Uh, it does a dehumidification, humidification, and HRV, and oh ERV. Goodness. Oh my goodness. Really? So it's a yeah. complete system. And into this... this That's uh, the holy grail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, we and, connect, and what, what CFM? 120, 180? No, this small one is only 500. So 500 CFM. Yeah. Okay. But also, with, also the other one, uh, the 1200, same thing. But is a two units combined, one dehumidification and one HRV. More commercial application, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, but the 120 have, that doesn't do dedicated DU. That's everything. everything. It's everything. Everything. Like for example, the one we install in uh, Pittsburgh University, we install four of these uh, big units and does a uh, HRV, ERV, dehumidification, and um, yeah, that's not the humidification, just the dehumidification. Yeah, and. Um, and we control it, so we run a chill water or hot water into these units. So, yeah, and everything's controlled through our. It has a lot of internal dampers and controls to. In this. Know, yeah. No, yeah. In, their, in their in their air control. units. Okay, so it was definitely an enlightening trip to California. Santa Cruz is a wonderful town, and the folks at Masana there in Santa Cruz are a wonderful group of people. Big thanks to Francesco and to Greg for spending so much time talking to us that day. We're sure some of you have a lot of questions about this because it still is a relatively unknown factor in the building equation. Christoph, what do you think? Okay, Christoph thoughts. Then uh, I have a few layers of thoughts here. The first one is, at a very basic level, this is not uh, all that profound in the sense that we're just using a fluid to move heat around, right? We, we all are very familiar with using 
air as a heat transfer fluid. It just so happens that air is not necessarily the best choice for that. And I think it's really important that we pay attention, right? We seem to be at a point in our society where, well, I guess it's a consumer society, and we consumers, we like nice stuff, and that means we like stuff that works. Um, the phone in my pocket is more powerful than my first desktop, right? So it's a symptom of me liking nice stuff. And particularly, one of the great reasons to like Radiant in the nice stuff category is thermal comfort. Here we are saying we are going to actually substantively improve indoor environmental quality from the feature of thermal comfort. And remember, indoor environmental quality has to do a lot with a lot more than just thermal comfort. It's light, odor, sound, vibration, air quality. Um, but being comfortable and being more healthy are really important reasons to consider this technology. And my professional opinion, surveying the landscape out there in the world of professionals delivering or purporting to deliver thermal comfort to people, is that they don't show people the full menu. They don't say, well, let's see, let's take it hierarchically. First, we can use air or water, two different heat transfer fluids. And then on the air side, we have variable capacity. And of course, on this water side, we have variable capacity. These are the, the valves that Greg was talking about controlling. So that's the first angle. Comfort's important, and that's why this is important. It just makes sense. The second angle is that what we're really trying to do is make humans and human factors central to the design of our buildings, right? And this doesn't just mean comfort. It, human factors could include and should include health, durability, energy efficiency, first costs, long-term costs of ownership, ease of installation, you know, a myriad different factors. And in fact, there are many reasons to believe and to observe that radiant-based systems are superior than forced air systems. Um, there are probably some market-based reasons why it's going to be uh, a gradual transition to this technology. You know, the, the consumer products industry is a super tanker and doesn't turn on a dime, but we are hoping in our small way to do some education and, and some advocacy for human factor building design through talking to companies like Misana. And I think it's also important to remember that Misana has some really smart engineers and some really great people. And Roberto Misana sounds like he is really uh, a true Renaissance man uh, and from Italy, no less. And that's also the, it's also the case that there are other companies in this product space. Right? This is just one that we've had good luck getting good access to and um, being able to reach out and, and manage to go visit. So, thank you guys for listening. That's all we have for now. I, d I would like to remind you that there was an earlier podcast on this same subject. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate you, and stay tuned for more episodes in the near future.